Ripple. I like that, Ripple. I thought it was for fruit. Uh, I'm Corey Johnson from Ripple here from San Francisco. And I want to talk to you about uh, some big ideas about blockchain and about globalization. Uh, and I, th I think it's helpful to explain what we do at Ripple. This is a fundamental overview of Ripple. So we just, well, the company was founded in 2012. We've got about 240 employees. We've got offices all over the world, San Francisco, London, Mumbai, Singapore, Sydney, Australia, New York City, Luxembourg, Tokyo. And we're fundamentally trying to provide a blockchain-based solution to move money across borders. And I think as everyone here, particularly in Singapore, knows, moving money across borders is slow and expensive and inefficient. We sign over 100 production contracts. These aren't pilots. These aren't tests. These are 100 customers who are paying us and using our software to solve some real big pain points in their business uh, about moving money across across the world. There, if you look up there, you surely see some financial institutions you know, uh, and at the least of which Standard Chartered, Santander, uh, Axis Bank, uh, again, some uh, SBI, a partner of ours in Japan as well. Um, the global payment system, everyone, as everyone knows, right, everyone in this room, like I said, we're in Singapore. It's been hard to get money here. It's hard to get money out. It's slow. It takes three to five days to transfer money. It's really expensive. It's expensive for individuals just paying fees. It's also expensive just for businesses that have to keep money parked in locations all around the world. The World Bank says that number is about $10 trillion sitting around for businesses uh, in accounts waiting to be used because they can't trust the ability to move money quickly. And it's unreliable. Unbelievable uh, amounts of failure in the current systems uh, that represent, uh, you know, 600 basis points, 6% uh, error rate, which is, it'd be like losing power an hour every day. Uh, it's a problem. So RippleNet allows for the, the money to move uh, on demand, real time. It's very low cost, 100% accuracy. You can see it happen while it happens. And it's pretty simple to use for our customers, the financial institutions uh, that are, are uh, want to serve their customers with new ways. And so we sell to financial institutions. Uh, likely, as Ripple's uh, products roll out in the marketplace, it'll be used by the banks and remittance companies that you use, and you'll never know it. Now, there's a lot of talk about what blockchain technology can do and the applications of blockchain technology, and, and there's great excitement about this. But we look at it in a much bigger way. We look at this notion of what is globalization and how can blockchain technology solve what, what we see as the last leg uh, to have a truly global uh, economy. Now, uh, in, when we look at the global economy and how it works right now, something's missing. Something's wrong with globalization right now. We know uh, the metaphor of fire, right? To, in order to have fire, you have to have three things. You have to have all three things. You've got to have heat. You've got to have fuel for the fire. And you have to have oxygen providing that fire with something uh, in, to burn that fuel. So when we look at globalization, We've got a necessary network of goods. There's a way to move goods. There's a network for moving goods all over the world uh, that's very robust and very efficient and very known uh, to work all over the world. And, and there's data now that moves all over the world quickly. I can send a text message from here to Rome in three seconds with a GIF and a bunch of emojis. I can send an email from New York City to, to Mexico uh, in a matter of seconds with an Excel spreadsheet attached and all kinds of information. But we don't have this when we look at the globalization. We've got goods, we've got data, but we don't have a way to move money efficiently and quickly. Let me uh, use another metaphor here. When we think of the pre-container era of shipping, I love talking about this in Singapore, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, San Francisco, places I go a lot, all sort of places that uh, built up around an economy, a way to move things. It used to be moving things across borders, moving stuff, goods. They'd throw it into sacks, took a lot of guys with a lot of hooks and nets and throwing it onto boats. It was very inefficient. And then came this new technology of containers. And in the post-container era, we have a standardized way all over the world to move things around the world. It's quick, it's efficient, it's a technology that no company owns, but everyone knows how it works. And new companies came up later to sort of master this technology. The shipping giants of the past are no longer the shipping giants of the present with this new technology. But the new technology of containers really changed the world and changed global commerce. And, and you know, here uh, uh, in Singapore, we, we know that to be true maybe more than anywhere. Let's think of the data world before the web. It was slow. It was, uh, it was isolated. It wasn't open. And it wasn't easy to move data around the world. But when we look at uh, what happens in a post-World Wide Web, uh, we suddenly have a, a world where there's a globalization of an instant transfer of data that happens all over the world. It's happening mobily. It's happening on smartphones. It's very robust. You can do all kinds of things that you could never do before. We know this is part of the globalization of data, buying a, an airline's ticket on Singapore Airlines on my phone and getting the data about 
how many hurricanes I'm going to have to dodge to get home this weekend, apparently. But that's the kind of where we're at with globalization and data. But we don't have that with money. The fees alone are extraordinary. We're $2 trillion a year spent in fees to move money across borders uh, in a process we've already identified as being slow and being a, a $2 trillion in expense and very inefficient. And that's if you want to send $10,000. Look, the fastest way to, t to move $10,000 is to put it in a suitcase and fly it there. But try sending 50 euro. It doesn't even make sense. The fees are so extraordinary, you want to send 50 euro, all that's going to get received is about 40. The fees are crazy. And if you think that's hard, try sending 50 cents. What would the world be like if we could send a 50%, a 50 cent payment to someone who'd be willing to do some work that they want to do and we want to have done, but you can't even have that kind of commerce in the world because of the antiquated 1970s technology, which is how money moves today across borders. So we imagine a world where using blockchain technology, you can send 50 cents, and you do it at low cost with 100% with efficiency and lack of errors. And then there could be machine-to-machine -machine transfers, where we've got uh, uh, you know, instruments written into smart contracts and coding that allows, once a task is done, a dollar amount or a penny amount is paid, micropayments could get paid machine-to-machine. -machine. This is impossible right now until the world of Ripple is, uh, arrives and the use of Ripple software and the use of blockchain technology that we use. Now the blockchain technology, so then the question is which one? There are so many flavors of blockchain technology. And when we, we work on this at Ripple, and when we look at all the things out there, we look at the, the, the excitement around Bitcoin, around Ether, and other technologies and blockchain, but we see problems. So let's, let's talk about comparing them all. What does it take to be a blockchain? It has to be open source, right? So everyone's gotta know how it works and anyone can work on it. It has to be uh, decentralized and permissionless. There can't be any one individual, group of people, country, or business that controls this blockchain network. And it has to be reliable and as secure as blockchain can wonderfully be, like nothing in the history of technology. And we know that there are elements of this in all of the true blockchain technologies, like XRP, which is what we use, like Ether, like, like Bitcoin, but let's talk about what the, the use case requirements are when we're talking about money. Because when you're moving value across borders, it's different than moving data. You've got to have settlement predictability. You've got to know what's going to happen when you make the trade, when you move the money. It's going to be very consistent in cost, so you know what it's going to cost you to get the thing done, to move that money across borders. It's got to have very high throughput, so you can get a lot of things to, to happen a lot. No one's going to want to walk into and use, uh, use a Visa card or move money and hit send and not know how long it's going to take. And then it's got to be scalable in terms of its energy usage. Its energy usage costs increase, and, and uh, it's got to be able to be a very big network without the energy costs getting higher. But if you look at the different solutions in the world of blockchain, they're not all the same. And they don't all have that predictability. They don't have the consistent uh, scalable energy use. If you look at the cost per transaction, XRP is enormously cheaper per transaction than Bitcoin Cash than Litecoin, than Ether, and certainly cheaper than, uh, than Bitcoin itself at $1.69 per, per transaction. Those are prices as of May. Uh, in terms of how fast it goes, XRP is enormously quick. It's three seconds per transaction on average in the, in the month of May or as of May 1st. When you look at the other uh, competing technologies, Ether is really fast, but it's 90 seconds. Do you want to uh, imagine any transaction you do paying your Uber buying food at a store, 90 seconds is a ridiculous amount of time to wait. But if you look at Bitcoin, you're looking at an enormously longer period of time. And also the transactions per second, the, uh, the, uh, the iterations of that, XRP can do 1,500 transactions a second, Bitcoin 32, Ether 16. Even Bitcoin Cash, supposedly to proven over that, is nowhere near what XRP can do. So you can see why we've relied on XRP for technological solution around blockchain and what is the right digital asset for payments. It is uh, from what we see, from what we all know about how these things work, I mean, you can see those numbers up there. The other uh, solutions in blockchain that are, that are active and trading all over the world cannot really compete when it comes to their ability to be cheap to use, to work fast, and to do lots and lots of transactions simultaneously around the world. The other problem is how often there are settlements on the network. You don't really know if you're using Bitcoin when it's going to happen. Is it going to happen in four minutes? Is it going to happen in 20 minutes? There are gaps all over. Ether is much faster, but even then you don't know how fast it's going to happen. 
because there are so many transactions possible in XRP, lots of transactions are possible in XRP, and they happen quickly. And so what we see is the ability to settle a transaction quickly and reliably because it's XRP and not a slower blockchain technology. Then there's the issue of energy, and there's a lot been written about this lately. When we look at what, uh, uh, what happens with Bitcoin mining and even Ether mining, they are using up so much energy that uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually getting to be a problem around the world, and it's harder and harder. The more the network scales, the more the energy consumption is. Because there is no active mine of XRP, there are a billion, uh, 100 billion XRP, and that's it. That's the list. There will never be any more XRP. There is no active mining, and the, 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 the transaction does not require the mining and the electricity that mining of Ether or Bitcoin requires. So how does our, we've got a couple products on the market, but the one that is most active in using XRP, using uh, a, a, a digital asset or cryptocurrency, whatever you want to call it, uh, is XRapid. And XRapid is the thing that we use that accesses cross-border liquidity and it turns uh, a certain fiat currency into XRP and XRP into another fiat currency and does it all super quickly uh, using exchanges that trade it. And there are over 90 exchanges that trade it. So let's use an example of moving money, let's say, from San Francisco to Mexico City. A, a bank will fire up a transaction or a financial institution or remittance company using our software. It's routed to uh, an exchange, in this case, Bittrex, one of the preferred exchanges, an exchange that is really focused not just on trading of uh, cri uh, cryptocurrencies for investors, but actual for payments. Focused on payments, Bittrex makes the exchange from US dollar to XRP. Is XRP is settled, it goes to Mexico on an exchange, XRP is traded into Mexican pesos and into the delivery bank. In this case, it took a minute 20 to do this. This is a real example. This is how this works. Um, imagine right now a system where you're sending money and it takes you three days. And you don't know where it's going and when it's hung up you don't know why. You're not sure who to call. You don't even know what the cost is going to be. Your bank might quote you only 600 basis points because they don't really know where the costs are going to be along the line. The bank might make money or lose money. 30% uh, of all money transfers across borders result in a customer phone call, which quite often can eat up the cost for the bank of, of what they thought they're going to make in profit. So it's uh, this system, moving money, again, from XRP through Bittrex into, a, in, into a XRP, from US dollar to XRP, from XRP to peso, all in a minute 20 with 100% accuracy, really is a game changer for uh, uh, the world of cross-border payments. Because right now, all of these uh, payment networks are disconnected. The banks, the potential to use blockchain, mobile money when we're using Venmo or Zelle or something, which is a, a, a fancy uh, uh, Ferrari body on a jalopy engine, these online wallets, none of this stuff is connected. But blockchain doesn't solve this problem on its own because you're not connecting all these other networks that people use to manage their money or to move their money. But this inner networking of payments with banks and blockchain and mobile money and all online wallets can work when it's all stitched together. What's the way to stitch it together? The Interledger Protocol. So another thing that we use is an open source protocol called the Interledger Protocol, and it connects all these different ledgers. It's an important part. So the ILP is an open protocol. There's lots of uh, individuals, a community group, working on this interledger protocol to build this global network. There are over 275 contributors to it from banks, central banks, such as the Bank of, uh, of England working on this, uh, Saudi Bank working on this, payment companies, t big tech companies working on this, such as Google, consulting companies, blockchain companies, and Ripple's right in the thick of using this interledger protocol with our software and using XRP to move money across borders, move value across borders. If you think about what happened in the world of the internet, when the internet was developed, there were all of these different technologies, HTTP, TCP, IP networks, Wi-Fi, but, but the way to connect this all together so importantly was IP, right? And so when we look at uh, value, we look at the interledger protocol as a way to connect all these different networks from the application level through the transport level, and then all the way down to the banks and the blockchains and the mobile money to stitch this all together and move this through an open source protocol around the world, and ILP does that. So for us, this is all about creating an internet of value. We had an internet of data. Uh, it has changed the world, but it is missing that crucial component of moving value. So with the Interledger protocol and with Ripple software and using XRP, We've created an internet of value that we've got already 100 customers rolled out in this. We're adding more customers every week. 
uh, and we think this is really going to create this internet of value that's really going to change the world and finally give us globalization in every way with our stuff, with our data, and yes, with our money. Thank you very much.